Wait a minute, David. This whole deployment process sounds nice, but why should I even bother with it? I can do everything directly in my production org. This just adds overhead. Well, you might be able to get away with doing things in production for some time, especially if you work in a tiny org with just a few people. But once your org grows, the deployment process is going to be essential. Here's why. First, you want to be able to test any changes you're making in a safe environment such as a sandbox. You know as well as I do that it often takes multiple tries to build something right. Until then, your users should not be exposed to your changes. Your components need to be properly built in a sandbox org, then deployed into production. Believe me, I've learned this one the hard way, multiple times. Another reason for deployment is you may want to launch something huge all at once. Manually building this may take multiple days, and before the final product is finished, your users could be getting errors in production. With a deployment, everything gets launched at once. And finally, if you're writing code, it has to be deployed in production. Salesforce strictly does not let you write code directly in production. And if you try, you're not even going to see the buttons to do so. This is the cause of many, many questions on the Salesforce community. Where's the new trigger button in my org? The answer, it's not there. You only get it in your sandbox. Your code must be deployed into production from there. But why does Salesforce force you to deploy code from Sandbox when you can build things like Process Builder directly in production? The answer is simple. Code is so much more powerful than Process Builder, and you must wield this power with great care and responsibility. In fact, coding is so powerful that many Salesforce orgs, especially larger ones, have formal multi-step deployment processes. When you become a full-time Salesforce developer for a great company, you'll probably follow a process just like this. In larger Salesforce orgs with multiple developers, each developer typically gets their very own sandbox. Developers typically don't share sandboxes because they don't want their code in progress to interfere with others. Imagine two developers in the same org, both writing different triggers on the account object. One person's changes are bound to tamper with the others, and resolving this is never fun. It's like when I go fishing with my dad and our fishing lines get tangled together. Extremely frustrating, and probably the reason why I didn't catch that massive halibut. Once a developer is done with their changes and all their test classes pass, it's time to deploy their components into a full sandbox org. The difference between a full sandbox org and a developer org is that full sandbox orgs have the same data your production orgs have. Developer orgs typically only have a subset or even none of that data. Once the code is deployed into a full sandbox org, you'll typically run all your test classes again. And if you're lucky, get a QA person to test your stuff too. This is important to do in a full sandbox org because you don't know if your code works well with real data instead of fake data created just for testing. For example, data in your full sandbox might not have certain fields populated, and the absence of this information could break your code. Finally, once things are stable in your full sandbox, your components would be given the green light to deploy into production. And after that, you'd probably do another round of testing just to be safe. As you can see, deployments can be a big deal, especially in larger Salesforce orgs. Hopefully, this also reinforces how important test classes are to you. In fact, the requirements for test classes and deployments are the same thing as the two are so closely tied to each other. Just as we learned during the test class module, we need 75% code coverage with all of our assertions passing. If we don't have any assertions, 
then 75% code coverage is sufficient. Remember, this means 75% of all code in your org needs to be covered by test classes, not just the specific code that you're deploying. The only exception to this rule is if you're deploying components other than code. Non-code components, such as workflow rules, can always be deployed regardless of your test class coverage. Once you think you've met all the requirements to start a deployment, what actually happens? Well, first you choose the components that need to be deployed. Then, Salesforce checks for any missing components in your deployment. For example, you could be deploying a new custom field on a new custom object, but forget to add that custom object to your deployment. In this case, you'll get an error telling you that you're missing a dependency. Then, Salesforce will run all test classes in your org. All of them, not just the ones you're deploying. Finally, Salesforce will return your results, pass or fail. If you met all the necessary requirements, your code will be deployed.